Mike was going to bring our message today. I hope everybody at home was sitting down when that was announced too. What would we do without technology? Kim was supposed to stay there, and I was supposed to come up here, and all of a sudden, oh, I gotta go get my phone. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Did everyone have a good Christmas and New Year's for the most part? We, we hope you did. Christmas is one of those times of year where it can, it can be really good, but for some it can be sad. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but before we do, um, how many of you remember H. Ross Perot? Back in the day, he ran for president. And of course, they have presidential debates and they have vice presidential debates. Do you remember his vice presidential running mate? Does any, I don't even remember his name. But I remember the debate. And the first question usually is, what can you tell us about yourself? And they, uh, I think they did him third, but I'm not sure. But I never forgot his answer as he started out uh, explaining himself. And, and it kind of went something like this. Who am I? What am I doing here? How did I get here? That's how I feel when I'm up here at a, at a pulpit giving a, a, a message on a Sunday morning. I really, I know who I have to blame for it. Um, and we, we love our pastor, but they're not, they're not blameless either, so we, we won't blame him for this, but uh, we'll see how this all goes. Have you ever been on an emotional mountaintop? An event or a situation that just lifted your spirit really high? What comes to mind when you think about that? How about a wedding? What a happy occasion. Man and a woman embarking on life as one. Parents giving their daughter to a, a, a young man in, in marriage. Uh, uh, that, uh, that's a happy thing. How about the birth of a child? Many of us are parents. Um, all kinds of emotions with that. Uh, there's anticipation. Once your child is here, there's, you know, you, you worry about them. So there's all kinds of emotions with that. Um, let's add to that, when a child is born, it's also a grandchild, and I can speak to that. There's nothing like being a grandparent. I, I just, I can truly say I was made to be puppet. Um, when you're, uh, when one of your grandchildren says to you, Papa, Excuse me. This wasn't planned. Papa, you're my favorite person. Um, you, you, it just, it, it touches you. Um, how about a great grandchild? Um, I have some friends here, our former pastors, Tim and Cheryl Evans, our great grandparents. Um, you know, they, they served God for years, um, and in that service, got called away from their home here in Maine, from family, their grandchildren, their children. Um, they've recently retired, and they're getting to experience something that very few of us get to, and that's a great grandchild. And, and I just, I, my, my heart, my heart just is overjoyed for them. Um, I love seeing pictures, little why in his name. What, what an expressive little boy he is. Um, Kim and I got to give him his first car ride. Um, the day that he came home from the hospital with his parents, uh, his aunt was getting married and they didn't have a ride home, so Kim and I offered to drive them home from the hospital. Um, and it was great reconnecting with Alicia and, and, and seeing that baby. And, and it's just, you know, it's one of those things that you, you just love. How about salvation? Does that ever get anyone on an emotional high? Um, for some, it's an instantaneous thing, um, and it lifts them up. Let's go the other direction. What about emotional lows? Anyone ever had an emotional low? 
Sadly, um, I, I look down and, and, and I see Sylvia here today. And I don't mean to bring up tragic and, and sad things, but um, you know, when we're feeling low, a lot of times some, there's someone else who's feeling low. Um, and, and remember that. I can, I, this year, the holidays, I've been a little bit down for different reasons. And then to hear about Nora, and, and I totally, my sorrow, my sadness, my love was nothing compared to what uh, Sylvia and Eric and, and the family were feeling. And we need, I think that's important. We can, it doesn't diminish ours, our low feeling, but uh, there are others, and it can divert your attention from your predicament, and you can focus on someone else, and, and they appreciate that, and it's needed. Um, and I'm always grateful for, for, for that. Let's, uh, let's, following that path, again, let's talk about weddings. We talk about weddings being happy. Sadly, a lot of times there are things related to that. There's an opposite to that. Um, weddings uh, are great. Sadly, divorce comes along. Just the opposite. Even though that was a great thing at the time, sadly, divorce happens. The birth of a child, and, and as I mentioned, with, with the passing of a child or a grandchild, is I don't like to call it balance, but my daughter, who is raising her own children now, and sometimes it's fun to watch, sometimes it's not so fun. Um, one of her favorite points that she makes, especially to the oldest one, Nathan, who's fun. Um, Nathan, there are consequences to your actions and decisions. And sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Um, sometimes there are consequences. We have to deal with those. Does it ever seem like you're up one minute and you're down the next? Do you, do you ever feel like when you're on that emotional high in the back of your mind, whoa, what's going to happen next? Okay. I, I look out now after this and, and uh, I'm tempted to ask the question and I actually wrote it down because I kind of knew the expressions that I'd be getting. How do you like this message so far? <laughs> you up, you down? Um, are you thinking where is he going with this? Those questions cross your minds? Yeah, Tina's eyebrows just went up. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I, I wondered too as, as this, but this thought kept going over and over in my mind. Um, as a Christian, have you ever thought, heard, or been taught that you should never be down, never doubt? I know I have. I've, I've been, I can remember hearing that. I've heard it from the pulpit at times. Um, I don't particularly subscribe to that, and hopefully this message will, will help someone. One of the things um, that I've always felt about the Word of God and the message is, at the very least, it should speak to the person giving it, for the most part. Not always. Sometimes it's a message laid upon a, a, a pastor's heart or a person's heart to give, and it's meant for, some, meant for someone specific. I can tell you today that this message is meant for me, for sure, and I hope that... Uh, it, it, it reaches people out here, and those of you who, I mean, there's the camera, yes. And it reaches someone perhaps listening online. Um, and and uh, we'll see how it goes. We're going to be jumping around for scripture today. That's why there's no scripture behind us. I'm not a techie guy, and the pastor's supposed to have the week off, so to speak, for the most part. Um, but we will be jumping around with scripture. 
And if you want to follow along, I'll try to give you time to, to fumble through your Bibles as I do. We're going to take a look at our Bibles, and we're going to start in Genesis chapter 16. And of course, I'm at the wrong page. Genesis chapter 16. Now this is the... Uh, 16? You know what? I'm not at the, at the wrong... I don't know where I am. I guess I don't know how to do my Bible. Might help if you get the right book. There we go. Genesis chapter 16. Uh, we're we're going to look at Abraham and Sarah. We're all pretty familiar with them. Abraham was promised a son. Abraham and Sarah were old when they were promised this son. I forget how old Abraham was. Pastor, do you remember? I didn't look it up. I'm going to pick on you. Do you remember how old Abraham was? Very old. Very old. <laughs> That's as good a word as any. <laughs> what was that, Kim? A hundred ish. A hundred ish. How many of you uh, folks out there would like to be told you were going to have a child in your hundreds? <laughs> No, Herb is the same. Yeah, well, I agree. Say no. no. So Abraham and Sarah were old. They were promised a son. Now, think about this. God had been with them for quite a few years. He had guided them, protected them uh, numerous times, and yet they doubted God's promise and came up with another solution, another plan. Now their plan was accepted and born in this day, uh, in back in that day, and their plan was that Abraham would be provided a son by him having uh, Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, and she would provide this child. Now, by today's standards, that's not how we do things, but back then that was, a, that was a, a, an accepted practice. So, do you, it was a good plan in that way, but um, it wasn't God's plan. And as we find out, Sarah turns up and does have a son. Now what do you do? You've got Sarah and her son, which obviously Sarah's going to be all in favor of. You've got Hagar with her son, and wait a minute, he's the firstborn, really. He's supposed to be Abraham's son. What's Abraham going to do? You get conflict. First of all, you've got this happiness. Oh, I've got a son. Now you've got two sons. That happiness turns to sadness when there's conflict. What happens to Hagar and Ishmael? They get sent away. Not so happy anymore. How many of us could send us a son and, and his mother away? His mother away. Doesn't sound like too much fun to me. Happy, sad. It happened in the first book of the Bible. Let's move on to Genesis chapter 21. I always like this story. <clears throat> and it's, it's where Sarah gives birth to Isaac, the promised son that God had, had told them of. That's a real happy time. Jump now to chapter 22. Who knows that story? Any guess what happens there? God tells Abraham to take his son, Isaac, who was promised to him and is going to be the father of many nations, tells him to take him to a mountain and sacrifice him. Think of that. Here's Abraham way up here. I got my son, the promise of God. After a few years, take him and sacrifice him on the altar because that's what sacrifice meant. You sacrifice them, you killed them. You sacrifice them, you shed their blood on the altar. 
Steve, would you have sacrificed Ben on an altar? No. I wouldn't have sacrificed my son, my daughter. I wouldn't have sacrificed an animal for that matter. I'm really glad that Jesus fulfilled all those sacrificial parts of the law because we don't have to do that anymore. But I can't imagine what Abraham must have thought. But we have an account of it. <coughs> Abraham takes Isaac to the mountain. And all the while, he's talking about God. If you want to read it, it's in chapter 22. Isaac asks all kinds of questions. You know, where's the sacrifice? Or this type of stuff. And, and Abraham says, God will provide. Interesting that he didn't come up with his own plan. I suspect he probably had finally learned that God's going to provide. And he followed God's direction. I want to stop here and, and add a point uh, uh, about this. Um, you'll know this God at work. If you follow the story from Genesis 16 through 22, you're going to see God at work through all of it. And for the most part, those really involved turning to God when they had their low point, when they had their doubts. And I think that's the key. Our emotions get in the way sometimes. And as with Sarah coming up with her own plan, I wonder how much that was because she thought, I don't know if I want a child at this age. Doesn't matter. The plan wasn't what God wanted. Let's move on to 1 Kings, another example in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 19. Most of us have heard the, the story of Elijah, the prophet of God. Elijah was, was faithful to God. God worked often and did uh, miraculous things in his life. In chapter 19, well, leading up to chapter 19, Elijah's fresh off a, a big victory. The prophets of Baal um, and ends up putting all of those prophets to death. They were uh, something that God told him to do. And he, fresh off this big victory, what happens after that victory? Jezebel happens. I want to read verses 1 through 5 uh, in chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Imagine that. And, and if you remember the story of, of the prophets of Baal, they had prayed and were wailing to their gods and call down fire from heaven, and it didn't happen. Elijah comes in, puts the animal on the altar, douses it with water, I believe, covers it with water. There's a trough around the altar that's full of water. Calls down fire from heaven just like that. The offering's uh, taken up by God, and he puts those prophets to, to, to the soul. One, I can't imagine how happy he must have felt, how satisfied, how gratified he, he felt. Um, and yet, Jezebel, just like that, says, you're going to be dead tomorrow. <coughs> that happiness, why did he flee for his life? If he is such a prophet of God, experienced all that God had done for him, 
And yet he ran. Called out to God and wanted to die. I pretty much call that complaining. How many of you have ever complained to God? Let me add that. How many of you have ever complained to God? Do you ever do it silently thinking God doesn't hear you? <laughs> I never forgot Mark Lowry one time. I think I've shared this before. We had, it was a concert that he had given and it was a love offering type thing. Well, there wasn't much quote unquote love in the offering. And he wasn't that happy about doing it. He said, you know, on the drive to the next one, I, I actually, I kind of let God know because he knew anyway how I was feeling. So you may as well share it with God because he, he knows what you're feeling anyway. <clears throat> but in all Elijah's complaining, as we just read, did he blame God? No, no, he didn't blame God. What did he do? He went to God. Had his concerns, had his doubts, no doubt. But he didn't run from God. He was running from the danger, yes, running from Jezebel. But he didn't run away from God. And God met him, met his needs. If you read on in, in that, you'll see where God provided food, provided water, shelter, and took care of him. The Old Testament has numerous accounts of highs and lows like this, encountered by God's people, prophets, and followers. And I think that's important. Read the Psalms. The Psalms, many of them are highs and lows. Um, in the same Psalm, even. Um, it's one of those things where, yeah, good and bad happen. How about the New Testament? How am I doing on time? Oh, yeah. This may, I don't know if this will be one of the shorter sermons or one of the long ones. I'm not sure how this will be. I have lots of stuff written down here, but I don't read verbatim because that's just not the way it's done. Let's start in Matthew. Let's start in Matthew. Matthew 1 in the birth of Christ. Quite an event. We talk about the birth of a child being a, a wonderful high for, for parents. Let's look at the father, his earthly father, Joseph. He's a devout Jew, looking forward to marriage to Mary. There's that happy high. Marriage is, is uh, uh, Mary as well, I suspect. She was pretty happy. And then the unthinkable. Mary's found to be with child. That's about as scandalous as it got back then for, for a, a couple, for a woman. Waiting to be married, the bride is pregnant, and Joseph knows it isn't his child. Pretty low moment for both Joseph and Mary. Shame, anger, fear, I can imagine all of those uh, emotions. I don't know all that could have happened, especially to Mary, but adultery, if I remember correctly, could lead to stoning. Joseph would have been within his rights to have her stoned. So I'm pretty sure, emotionally, it would, they, they were pretty low. Let's look at verses 18 through 25 in chapter 1 of Matthew. I'm going to read those if I can find them. Bear with me just a moment here. All right. Verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, 
Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place <clears throat> to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So what did Joseph do? Did he stone her? Did he have her branded an adulteress? No. He thought to avoid public disgracing of her, and wanted to divorce her quietly. He also listened to God who told him what to do. Now I would think Mary for sure and Joseph were both on that high, at least heading up to it. Um, they're getting married and all that. And, and as we said, she turns up pregnant and, and well, it kind of went downhill from there, but it could have been a lot worse. And again, did either one of them blame God for the situation? I mean, Joseph, as I said, he could have done any number of things, or had done to Mary any number of things, but he didn't. I think that says a lot about Joseph. I, I often want, we, we discussed this in Bible study a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. Joseph's one of those guys I want to look up and, and talk to in heaven, because I think he must have been an amazing man. I really do. I'm, I, I can't imagine what went through his mind, really. But God was clear that instead of being vindictive, vengeful, letting anger get the best of him, he wanted to really treat Mary pretty well, I think. And they both went to God. If you remember, in some of the other Gospels, it talks about Mary with child going to, uh, I can't think of his name now. Her, no, her cousin. Uh, yeah, John, John the Baptist, John the Baptist's mother. Uh, and and uh, so she, uh, uh, she turned to God. Uh, Joseph turned to God and, and listened to a dream. Now, I'm not big on dreams, but I know some people are. And, and dreams are important, and, and the Bible's clear on that. Most of my dreams are stupid. I don't remember them. My wife has dreams. Oh, the dreams, the stories I can tell. They are amazing. And I don't know how she remembers all the detail. My dreams usually, by the time I'm standing up after waking up, I have forgotten the dream, unless it's really dumb. And then I want to forget. But jo Joseph had a dream, and he followed what God's direction was. Um, he must have had a really close connection with, with God. And and again, I'm like I want to. I'm going to look Joseph up when I get to heaven. Now I mentioned John the Baptist. Let's look at John the Baptist. Talk about highs. Um, he baptized Jesus in, in the Jordan River, saw uh, a dove come down and, and representing the Holy Spirit and land on Jesus and heard a voice from heaven saying that Jesus was his son. That's pretty high point. Uh, do you think you'd remember that if you, I mean, when Jesus walked up there and told him he wanted to be baptized, John recognized him and said, I'm baptizing you. I have need of, to be baptized of, of you, John said. And, and so he experienced that, saw all that. What happened to John? I don't know the exact time frame of it, but John ends up in prison and doubted what he'd seen. And if you remember the story, John sent a uh, uh, some of his disciples uh, to Jesus and asked him, are you the one we look for? Now think about that. He baptized the Son of God, saw the Holy Spirit come down and light on him, heard the voice of God. I assume it was the voice of God. 
said, My son, who hears my son, whom I am well pleased. And yet he doubted in, in prison. That's pretty high, and then you get in prison, pretty low point. What ultimately ended up happening to John? He was beheaded. I wonder if he knew that was coming. I wonder what his doubt was the rest of his time in prison. We don't know. I suspect. I'd like to think that John was okay with it. I don't know that I would be, um, but I'm not John, um, and I'm pretty sure that that he was he was okay with that. John doubted. What did John do? Did he blame God? He went to God in the form of Jesus. Notice a pattern here? High, you low, what do you do with that swing in emotions and, and how do you deal with it? We talked about some of that in Bible study the last few weeks as well. They went to God. We talked about John in particular. That's one reason I put him in here. Pastor brought up during our Bible study. Yeah, John had doubts. Instead of letting them smolder and fester and worry and all that, he went to God, sent someone to Jesus to find out what was going on. And he got an answer. Oh, let's see. Let's look at the disciples. The disciples, throughout the gospel accounts, they saw miracle after miracle, and yet they had doubt after doubt, highs and lows, culminating with the crucifixion, the burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Talk about highs and lows, highs and lows. Um, here we have Jesus, and he's the Messiah, and they believe it, and they're all excited about that, and then, lo and behold, the Garden of Gethsemane, he's arrested, they've watched the trial, the crucifixion, nailed to a cross, put in the tomb. I call that pretty low for me. Um, yet it all worked out. They didn't run from God, and they didn't blame God either. Yeah, they huddled in a room, the ladies on the first day went to the tomb. I wonder what they felt like. Um, I wonder sometimes what went through their minds um, with all of that. I got one more for you. What about Jesus? You think Jesus had highs and lows? He's the Son of God knew his purpose. He loves all creation. He created it. He lived to die for us. His love for us is full of highs and lows. I, I saw a, a, a thing on Facebook the other day, and I shared it. I thought it was really good. Um, and it goes something like, uh, uh, this is me Imagine me talking to a squirrel, telling it to get out of the road because it's going to die. I might run, it's going to get run over. That's pretty much how God looks at me when I'm living my life sometimes. He's up there saying, Mike, don't do that. You know, <laughs> get out of the road, you idiot. <laughs> I, I, I think that, I wish I could remember it. I, I just saw it the other day and I didn't save it to, to read it. But isn't that true? Don't we? I think sometimes we look like a squirrel going, if you've ever seen a squirrel in the road, it goes this way, it goes that way, it goes back and forth. And I've had them stop and I've driven right over them and not hit them. How? I don't know. But yeah, I'm that squirrel sometimes. Oh, I lost my place. He called the, the uh, thing, speaking of Jesus, he called the disciples. That was a high for him as they responded. Well, 
none of them questioned it. They, many of them just dropped what they were doing, left everything, and, and followed him. Um, and yet, those same disciples throughout the gospel accounts, they, they let him down. They questioned, they doubted. I think of uh, uh, Peter getting out of the boat in the water during the storm. Um, took his eyes off of Jesus, began to sink, and, and it doesn't say Peter reached out to him, but he got out of that boat. So he was going to Jesus, and then the circumstances around him brought him down and he began to sink. Jesus lifted him up. And throughout the, the Gospels, um, there were time and time again, the Savior and the disciples found their way back together. How about the Garden of Gethsemane? This is mostly about Jesus. The disciples fell asleep while Jesus was praying. He asked God to remove this cup from him. He knows what he's going to do. He knows what he's supposed to be here for. He knows he has to do it. Yet even Jesus asked God if he could take this cup from him. But what else did he say? Yet not my will but God. How about on the cross? Jesus is quoted as saying in Scripture, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sounds like a pretty low one. I, I've seen that scene depicted, and I think rather, rather uh, accurately, just darkness all over. And, and I, I don't think I could look on while my son or my child, son or daughter, if they were being crucified, I'd have to look away. Even though that was part of the plan, that had to be a pretty, pretty low spot. And yet, what happened after that? Empty, Empty tomb, resurrection. So you've got, oh, they've killed my Savior. Three days later, empty tomb. It says they, they ran back to the disciples, and the disciples ran to the tomb. A good high point, I'd say. Let me close with these thoughts. This I may read because, well, it's easier than trying to memorize it. Are we any different than these folks in the Bible? Are we any better? Should we be any better? Because we have their example to look at. I believe we have their examples to help us realize that we ain't perfect, we will always be human, and what we do when high or low is the key. One of the things I love about God, the Bible, and our metaphors that we use is the fact that examples can be used in many ways. Let's take the mountaintop, emotional high, if you will. That's what it usually means. Um, it's meant in a good life, victory, a high point, a happy point. And in real life, a mountaintop can be a, uh, yeah, in real life, a mountaintop can be a harsh place filled with danger. Think about Mount Everest. Yet as dangerous as the summit is on Mount Everest, um, there is uh, great beauty and there's really a majestic, uh, I, I'm not big on heights. I've climbed uh, Mount Chikara a couple of times now in my life, shockingly. To me especially. I remember my my daughter seeing me the first time said, There's dad, Mom, because I had they had left me back a ways because I didn't want to get up there. But as it turns out I had to go. And uh, my wife just couldn't believe her eyes. I was there, I was laying down, I touched the top, I turned around and I left. <laughs> but it was a mountaintop and, and it was it they are beautiful up there, but there's great danger as well. <clears throat> And the thing about it is, it's God, it's all God's creation. And God is there. How about the valley? We think of the valley as a low spot. We talk about it a lot of times. And 
hardship, trouble, those types of things. Yet in real life, a valley is often a fertile area. It's bursting with vegetation, water, and life, sustaining life even. Yet a fertile valley can also flood, or dependent on the surrounding landscape, it can be a trap because you're confined. A lot of times, if the people are, I know in battle, the last thing they want to do is go into a narrow valley or canyon, if you will, because it, it's, a, it's an easy place to be ambushed. Yet, it's all God's creation. It's both good and bad, can be, and God is there as well. And that's the whole point. No matter, no matter where we are, no matter what is happening, God is always there. And that's the end of my message today. I hope that it was meaningful to you. I know it was for me. Um, as I said earlier, I've, had, I've been a little bit down this year, uh, around the holidays. Um, and it's okay. It's okay to be down. So what we do with that down is, is the key. I'm going to ask my wife if she'd come and, and close us in prayer. Yes. Jesus, that you are our living hope. We ask, Lord, that you go with us as we go our each way, and Lord, that we would remember that you are there in the dark times and in the sunshine, in all our times. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I bless you and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>